go, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's about to be a lit day today. Hey, let's get back to our swagger, come on. All of them get the dough down. That is the juggernaut. Welcome to the Audible presented by Verizon. With 5G built right for the Vikings, Minnesota can scream, stream, and share every play in Verizon 5G quality. Well, Ben, this is episode four of the Audible presented by Verizon. Of course, my name is Gabe Henderson alongside Ben Lieber. And we finally got a win in the win column. <laughs> Before we talk about that, I got to give fans an update on who is going to be joining the show today. And it's none other than the $92 million man Woo, himself. Oh, boy. Is he, is he gonna come in here and just like with this bag of money, just, <laughs> yeah. just weighing him down? Yeah, just pull him down, okay. Yeah. So it's only 80 million in this bag, but his name is Brian O'Neill and he is one of the best right tackles in the game. We'll get an opportunity to learn a little bit more about him, get to learn a little bit more about him off the field as well as on the field, but more importantly about this upcoming matchup against Miles Garrett mm. and Jadavion Clowney. But mm. like I was talking about in the beginning, we beat the Seattle Seahawks, got, on the, got in the win column for the first time. You had us winning by 10. We won by 13, winning 30 to 17, a tale of two halves. Uh, this Minnesota Vikings offense and, well, defense in particular, yeah. gave up 17 first half points. Figured it out in the end because the offense controlled the time of possession. But your overall thoughts on the Minnesota Vikings win last week, last <laughs> Sunday, in front of 66,729 purple Wow, purple you got fans. the exact number I in there. I got the number. You got the exact <laughs> number. That is what it was, 66,000 plus. Yeah. Mm. Oh, but got, but got, really, gotta have the nine. Yeah, you gotta have the details. All about the details. Um, well, first of all, it was it was fantastic to have the fans in there. Um, Vikings production, you know, has kind of a, the new opening. Love that. You know, I, I do think that uh, I tell all the fans there if they're going to the game for the first time, get there early because there's a lot to see and do in and around the stadium, and then all the pre-production stuff, uh, pre-game production stuff, I should say that happens before the players even run out is something to watch as well. It's the, it's the experience that you don't get on TV. Right. Um, it, it was great to see. It was fresh. Uh, you could feel the energy in the building. The fans were hype at all the right moments. So I, I thought they really brought their A game as, as much as the, the players and the team did. I mean, there's a lot to be excited about when you watch this last game and you look at it and you kind of analyze it. You know, Alexander Madison going for 112 rushing on the ground, along with the screen game and the passing game as well. Over 170 yards total offense out of him. Um, he filled in great. I mean, I thought his vision was incredible. I thought his lateral movement was quicker than we've seen in the past. You could tell he was juiced up and ready to go. Offensive line played great. Clint Kubiak called a great game. Kirk has been outstanding. And then the defense, um, oh, Tyler Conklin, oh. Can't, can't forget that. He, oh. he, he splashed in a major way, career day for him. Yep. Uh, good to get the tight ends involved. The defensively, didn't love the first half. Um, you know, it seems like some of the issues we had in week two with Arizona, where we were dropping guys in coverage, where we just weren't alert, maybe our, our, our eye discipline or whatever it was, just wasn't there in the first half. Come out in the second half, like you mentioned, time of possession really favored our defense. Uh, kept their offense on the field or on the sideline. I do think in the second half, we our, our pressure packages really confused them, along yeah. with the crowd noise. When we went up there and mugged a bunch of guys and we would either drop all seven and only rush four or run a zone blitz or bring a fifth or sixth extra guy, it had those guys confused. You could tell they were off balance. Yeah. And, and I was surprised that Russell Wilson was as sort of skittish as he was. Yeah. Uh, on some of his passions, really rushing some throws. When, when you look back at the film, like that's not usually him. Right. Like usually he stays in the, in the pocket a little bit more and delivers a strike when he knows he's gonna get hit. But he wanted no part of that of that blitz package yeah. and, uh, and it really affected him. It really affected him. And like you said, the crowd noise, that played a big factor too. 66 plus thousand fans in attendance. It was Russell Wilson's first ever game at U.S. Bank Stadium, so maybe that played into the effect of him being skittish a little bit. But like you said, when you look on the film, it's just like, Russell usually makes some of those throws. Worked in our favor this time, but at the end of the day, I got to talk about these fans. I know for players, there's, there's for a lot of players, it was their first time in over a year having fans. For Justin Jefferson, he's never seen it. Um, you're on the field. I'm in the booth during the game. But for being on the field, not being in a jersey, what was the experience like for you? Well, that, that first goal chant that they did, um, you could see 
and I, and I sort of just like consciously tried to pay attention to this is I was looking on the other side of the field yeah, and I could see a lot of the Seahawks players sort of enamored as well. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were curious. I'm sure a lot of those guys have never seen it in person and you could just see them all just kind of like looking around and yeah. looking around. And so like, so they were, they were, you know, into it and, and in, a, in a way it kind of took them out of their mindset. Right. And of course I looked in our own sidelines and you see a lot of our guys like big smiles on their yeah. faces. They were, they were loving it. They you were feeling it. there and that was juicing them up. Yeah. Um, and that happened at several points in the game. And then like I talked about with um, the blitz package in the second half, there'd be a couple plays where the play would happen, we get some pressure on Russell, and then you immediately see the offensive linemen all looking at each other, all trying to communicate, like yeah. pointing, like, you know, almost like you, I thought you had this yeah. guy, I had this guy, we were doing this. So they were discombobulated. You yeah. know, they, I don't think they could hear because of the, the crowd noise. Um, they were confused by, by the number of guys lining up in the gaps and didn't know what was gonna happen. So it all works together. Right. That's, that's why you wanna play at home in front of a crowd like ours. Well, you know who was really good when they played here? His name was Kevin Williams. Mm -hmm. He was your teammate. Mm -hmm. He's getting inducted into the Ring of Honor this upcoming Sunday. So before before we go any further, what was your favorite memory of, of him? You played with him for five years. Yeah. You know, Kevin, is he's a special player um, because he never wanted the attention on himself. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he sort of had an offensive lineman mentality, mentality where he was all about just doing the work and, and he'll get He'll get his proper praise when it's when it's granted and and when it's acceptable at the right time. And we definitely gave it give it to him in the locker room. It's funny, you know, around here in these parts, you know, Kevin Garnett was known as the big ticket yeah. with uh, with the Timberwolves, and you know, he was our big ticket in the locker room. I mean, that was that was his nickname, Ticket or Big Ticket. And yeah. and you know, you got Garnett who's bombastic, yeah. right? Like he is out there. He is he is making everybody known that he's in the room. And, yeah. and then our big ticket was quiet guy right you know um i mean some of my, my favorite memories are really just the way he he went out and worked every day i mean he was um sort of this quiet destroyer that would go out there and you know he he always chewed gum you know when he played whether it's um practice or in a game he never wore a mouthpiece um <laughs> so he would just sort of i don't know how he did it where he that's didn't, so crazy yeah i don't know how he did it where he didn't choke on it um, I don't know if it was the same piece of gum. I don't know if he'd oh, lose God. it in a game and he would just have to get multiple sticks during the course of the game. I hope it was like big league chew where you could like take out a big no, clump. I, th I think it was just like a single stick of gum. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And it's funny because, you know, you've got this guy that is extremely explosive, um, you know, great technician of what he's doing. You know, one of the best three techniques in the, in the game. And, you know, you'd be, in, you'd be calling a play uh, he might just come off a sack, yeah. you know, do a little celebration, and he's got to get the next play, and he's just like chewing on his gum. And I was like, <laughs> dude, you're just like, like get excited, man. Yeah, you're just like just hanging out, just playing football, yeah. you know, having fun, and and he kind of had that uh, that backyard mentality where he's just chewing gum and relaxing. You know, the other the other thing is, um, and I'd never seen this before, so I, I wondered for the first couple of weeks like what was going on. Yeah, when I got here in 2006. You know, first game, I noticed he sits just like this on the edge of the, the bench and yep. he puts a Gatorade towel on, on his feet and he just, and just, oh, he pukes? He just pukes up oh, everything. Oh my gosh. I, I don't, I, you know. I've seen that, but like, but a guy that big? Yeah, he just, I, I asked him later on, like, why do you do it? He's like, I don't know. He's like, I, he's like, I just feel better when I don't have anything in my stomach. So I just make sure that I get everything out. So I, Dude, I, I don't know his whole regimen. I don't know when he eats breakfast for a noon game. I don't know if he's like up super early having yeah. breakfast or he doesn't eat breakfast or what. I, I don't know. It was bizarre because it's not like he had to gag himself. Yeah. Oh, so it just He naturally, just would like do oh it. Oh my gosh. I'm like, how do you so do So it's like that? clockwork. Yeah. I'm like, oh whatever, I'm sick. I don't even want to puke, you know? Yeah. yeah I like that thought of me puking. I'll drink a Sprite. It. Yeah. And he's over just like, like a cat, just like a... Oh, oh. <laughs> well, he made a lot of opposing yeah. quarterbacks throw up. Well, at least after he sacked those quarterbacks. I mean, 63 career sacks overall. It'll be exciting just to see him uh, back at U.S. Bank Stadium in front of this purple, uh, raucous crowd and just getting the dessert, the, the honor that he deserves, yeah. getting into the ring of honor. So, um, Ben, we got to go to break. We got to pay some bills. But in the meantime, stay tuned for our guest of the week, Brian O'Neill, joining the Audible right here, presented by Verizon. What was the last great debate that you've had? With I don't, your I don't know if it's a great debate, but there was a question posed in the locker room is, if you won the lottery for $450 million, 
would you come into the building the next day? <laughs> All right, we are back. This is the Audible presented by Verizon. My name is Gabe Henderson, and I am alongside Offensive tackle for the Vikings, Brian O'Neill. B.O., how you doing, man? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. So we start every segment off with a trivia question. Okay. The, today we got two trivia questions. One's Pitt Panther theme because you went to the univers University of Pitt. The other, the other is Vikings theme. You, you ready? Yep. All right. First question. Since 2015, how many Pitt players have been drafted by the Vikings? Four. T.J. Clemmings, offensive tackle. Okay. Myself, offensive tackle. Pat Jones, defensive end, and Jalen Twyman, a defensive tackle. It's like you, like looking at my sheet. You got it. You literally got him in order. So you know your guy. I mean, there's only one before me, and then there's two rookies this year. So it's pretty, pretty. I mean, I don't want to say basic, but like, <laughs> it's All pretty right. basic. All right. Well, since that's basic, which pit player was drafted the highest by the Vikings? Myself. Mmm. This guy was drafted in 1985. Oh, like overall? Overall. <sighs> Chris Dolman? Wow. Yeah. So he was drafted fourth overall in the 1985 draft. You are the third highest pit player drafted behind Chris Dolman and Randy Holloway, who was the 21st overall in 1978. All three of you guys were drafted by the Vikings, but... You got it right. Okay. Got cool. it right. Cool. I so wouldn't have gotten Randy Holloway, but. Really? No. I don't know who that is, but. <laughs> it's all good. But I, we, we got to start because, you know, I preface this question by saying a couple of weeks ago, we had Michael Pierce in, in the seat that you're sitting in right now. And I asked him, I said, like, what's the last debate that you've had in the locker room or like with one of your teammates? Like a fun question. And it was like financial literacy, like him, Dalvin Tomlinson, like a lot of the defense linemen were talking about financial literacy, what they can do with their finances, how they can save money up, and so on and so forth. You majored in finance at the University of Pitt. Why? I thought you were going to ask me my last debate. In oh, that's coming up. Uh, <laughs> but at the time, I knew I wanted to be in the business school, um, and I knew I didn't want to be like an HR in marketing. I just didn't think that gave me enough options at the time, and I knew yeah. I wasn't going to be an accountant, and so finance was the next best major that I felt was gonna push me and was respectable enough to yeah. maybe get a job if football didn't work out but hopefully I don't ever have to have a job in finance because I hated every minute of it yeah so you hated every minute of it but it was still something that pushed you yeah no doubt I had to work hard at school okay now going back to my other question that you thought I was going to ask you what's the last great debate that you've had with I, don't, your I don't know if it's a great debate but there was a question posed in the locker room is if you won the lottery for $450 million, would you come into the building the next day? <laughs> and like the overwhelming responses were yes. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, yeah, then like for anybody, this, it's just even more fun because it's just coming in to play football and you don't have to worry about anything mm. except like doing your best and being the best you can be. So like 450 million on top of your salary. Yeah. I mean, I guess Pat Mahomes could probably probably answer that question but still that's oh man that's not really a good debate we've had better ones but. okay you got another mm, okay so this was a debate that we had in the training room today okay and I'm happy you brought it up Adam Thielen said that basketball players are the best athletes <sighs> and people who are really good at basketball can play other sports and the argument was that basketball players are better at every other sport than hockey players and like hockey players can only play hockey yeah. was like the premise of the argument. And he was like, I wouldn't be in the NFL if I didn't play basketball. <laughs> and so the argument was like, if you're good at basketball, that translates to many other sports. So what are you, what's your? I agree. I, play, I mean, I grew up playing basketball. I thought that's what I was gonna be best at. I thought that was my favorite for a while. Then I got into high school a year or two. I was like, all right, I could probably play college football. That's a great point. I, I would probably, I would agree with you that basketball players like it translates to other sports, but like best athletes, I think triathletes are. To be able to run, swim, and I can't think of the third, or bike and bike, like all in one sequence, it takes a lot of stamina, but like, that's, that's like a level of like athleticism that's like out of this world. Yeah, but that's all endurance based. 
You take, I mean, like, I personally think the best athletes are like world class soccer players. Mm. It's like they gotta have endurance, they gotta have skill, they gotta yeah. have hand foot. You can't use your hands. Foot eye coordination, however you wanna put it. But I don't know. That was that was the that was a heated debate today okay. in the locker room was if hockey players could be good athletes in anything else. All right, well we're gonna rewind back uh, to you when you played in high school. You're from Wilmington, Delaware, uh, born and raised there, right? Yep. So are you were you west of I ninety five or east of I ninety five? Because I know it's like Jersey, Philly, Delaware, all within that area. I don't know. I-95 was like a 30-second drive from my house. Right. So I want to say east. Okay. But um, I-95 was like the main highway I took. I was three exits uh, into Delaware on 95 from like Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. So I always tell people, like when I went to Pittsburgh, I was like, I'm from Delaware. And people are like, where's Delaware? And I'm like, oh, it's like 30, 40 minutes outside of Philly. Yeah. And then there's people who lived two hours away from Philly, and they're like, oh, I'm from just outside of Philly. And everybody's like, oh, I got it. I'm like, I'm from Delaware, and you think I live in Maine. Yeah. But, like, I'm closer to Philly than you are. But, uh, yeah, right, right south of Philly. I mean, I would, last night I was watching your high school basketball highlight tape, and I was like, like, why is never, why has nobody ever, like, brought this up? Averaging 13.8 points in high school, you play with Don, Dante DiVincenzo? Yep, yep. Like, you wore number 24. Like, talk to me, man. Like, we got the pictures in the background. <laughs> <laughs> like, you I were was actually, hoping nobody would ever find those. They actually <laughs> played them in the offensive meeting one time last year in front of the whole offense. Um, there was some laughs, for sure. Yeah. But it's, it probably got to be some, like, oh, like, because you don't expect that from an offensive lineman. I know you didn't play offensive lineman in high school, though. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, a lot of people came up to me afterwards, like, hey, I'll bet you we, I beat you in one-on-one. After seeing it, I was like, dang, it was that bad. So do you, do you have a teammate that you could say right now at 305 that I could beat this person in basketball? Who would it be? I mean, I always tell Rashad that I could beat him. He's pretty good, though. Yeah, right? he is. And I've heard he's actually really good. I haven't seen him play. Um, but from my understanding is Justin's the best player on the team hmm. and it's not close. So you take that as a challenge? No, I, I, <laughs> I want no part of that, but just general knowledge for the fans out there. Apparently JJ is the best by far. Tyler Conklin out here is pretty good too. He is good. He actually went to central Michigan mm -hmm. to play basketball at first. It's crazy. Like seeing bigger guys like you playing like point guard. Like I was reading an article, your coach basically said you played center, but in your head you were a point guard. Like you, you were a slasher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, so you're good with the ball in your hands? No, I just thought I was. <laughs> so, but with that said, I mean, it takes a, a certain amount of footwork, right? To be good in basketball, to be a slasher, to play in the post. And I'm sure that's like translated to when you got to college, right? When you moved from tight end to left tackle or right tackle at University of Pitt? Yeah, I think so. Also playing wide receiver and tight end in high school, being what I thought was a skilled position yeah. player. Um, that helped, everything translated. Um, I just think all kids should play multiple sports yes. growing up in high school. Um, I just think it helps, it's more fun. Well, now we gotta talk a little bit on the field. Off the field is over, it's game week. We finally got a win. We have a big, Big game on Sunday. Every game is big, right? But when you're playing a team in the Cleveland Browns that made it to the playoffs last year, we have a lot of similarities with those guys. This game, you know, this, the stakes raise a little bit higher, even though we want to get a win. So when you have seen these guys on film, I'm sure you've watched film, or a lot of film. I hope you have at least. What are some things that, that stand out to you? Just the talent they have up front. Um, have a ton of respect for Miles Garrett, Jadavian Clowney, Tack McKinley a former teammate of Fadi Adenabo. Um, so just the guys they have up front are, you know, are really talented and it's going to be a big challenge for our group up front. But um, we're going to have a good week and go out and throw our best shot. How does preparing with a guy like Daniel Hunter help when preparing for Miles Garrett or Jadavion Clowney? Even though they're different guys, the, the caliber of talent, how does that compare? It helps a lot. I mean, Daniel goes hard every single day in practice. He doesn't take a day off. He doesn't take a rep off. Um, he, you know, he's a world-class player. He's a professional, so um, he gives a great look whenever I get a chance to go up against him, especially on a week like this where you're going to see somebody at the same level yeah. um, is huge because you can't really ever simulate those reps going against a scout team, but you can against a guy like Daniel. 
I mean, you've been there for, for a little bit now. You're starting to, to grow. You finally got the extension that, that was well-deserved. But now you got guys looking up to you that you're, you're bringing along. And Christian Derisaw, who had his first full practice in the NFL this week. How has it been, you know, growing with him as well as these other guys that, that look up to you? I know you don't think they look up to you, but you're, you're the guy now. Uh, I mean, it's cool. It was cool to see Christian out there because um, you never really know. The only way he can, you can gauge his progress is by his, whether he's answering the questions right or paying attention in meetings or taking the right footwork and individual, um, which he was. But you really don't know until you see somebody go block somebody yeah. at full speed live rep. And he did that and did it really well. And there was a couple of times you're like, OK, like, <laughs> let's go. You know, it was good to see. Like, it was good to see him, like, make a good block and then, like, smile and be excited about playing football just because he hasn't. Um, and we haven't seen it. And so I'm really excited for him. I hope he keeps working and keeps getting better. So with this Cleveland Browns team, I'm not even going to name off stats because I know you don't care about the opponent. You don't care about who's front of you. But facing a good defense the way they are, what is the mindset knowing that they are known for being a stout defense? Don't back down. I mean, we're known for being a stout offense. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have a standard that we like to play at. And, um, you know, we have the utmost respect for them. You yeah. know, they're good players. We're not taking anything lightly. Um, ton of talent across the board. Um, so, you know, and obviously, Coach Stefanski knows our offense pretty well from yeah. his time here. Um, so, you know, it's a big challenge, but, you know, it's a big challenge every week in the NFL. You yeah. got to man up and go meet it and throw your best, throw your best shot and, you know, live with the result at the end of the day. Last but not least, the Purple Faithful will be in attendance again. So how excited are you to play in front of fans for the second week in a row? It's going to be awesome. It was so cool. We, we were even saying it was so cool in the preseason. Yeah. And it wasn't packed, but it was just so cool to welcome fans back there. You know, they're a big part of what we do there. Um, and it was cool to have to watch another offense deal with the noise on third down <laughs> rather than us like the first two weeks. Um, so that was pretty cool. And just to see how happy people were to be back. And it made, made you feel like, you know, football and the world is somewhat normal again. So it was really cool. I, I was, loved it. I was excited. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for joining me. Brian O'Neill, Bro Nil, B.O. Appreciate it. Whatever you want to call him. I'm looking forward to another big game on Sunday, man. Best of luck going forward, and we'll catch up with you after the game, bro. Awesome. Sounds good. Yes, sir. Brian O'Neill.